Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science teacher for 15 years, and now I travel around the world and talk about creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. In uh, videotape number two of my series, we talked about dinosaurs and how they're mentioned in the Bible and how they're mentioned all through history. And tonight I want to talk about something just a little different. Uh, Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon mentioned in Job chapter 41. Pretty neat chapter. You ought to read that one. We'll talk some about that in just a minute. But when I was in seventh grade, I forget if it was the fourth or fifth time through. I was raised in East Peoria, Illinois, and my friend David came over to visit one night, or one afternoon, a real hot July afternoon. And we were horsing around, and you know how seventh graders are, they don't pay attention to the time very well. And anyway, we played too long. It came time for David to go home, and he forgot to go home, and started to get toward dark. And David said, Kent, what am I going to do? It's going to be dark in 20 minutes. I've got to ride my bike down Highway 150 for three miles. I can't get home in 20 minutes. And I don't want to ride down Highway 150 in the dark. I said, well, David, I'll take care of it. Let me go talk to my mom. I went and talked to mom and said, Mom, listen, we got a problem. David needs to get his bike home, and it's going to be dark, and he doesn't want to ride down the highway in the dark. So um, how about, since the bike, bike won't fit in the Volkswagen, you let me sit on the bike and hang on to the side of the Volkswagen, and you can pull us down the highway and get us home quicker. And my mom said, absolutely not. That's the dumbest idea I ever heard of in my life. But you kids know how it is. If you beg your parents long enough, you can talk them into just about anything. How many know what I'm talking about? You just keep begging and begging. Oh, come on, mom. Come on, mom. I said, mom, come on. Just do it one time. I said, my brothers do it with me all the time. <laughs> and they did. I had two older brothers. They used to let me hang on the side of their car, and they'd pull me around the neighborhood. Looking back on it now, I realized they were trying to kill me. <laughs> but at the time, I didn't know that. And I thought, hey, this is fun, you know? So finally, I said, come on, Mom, come on, Mom. And I talked her into it. Against her better judgment, my mom said, OK, let's go. So I sat on David's five-speed bike and held on to the side of the Volkswagen. And she started pulling me down Highway 150 from East Peoria to Morton, Illinois. Back in those days, Highway 150 was a tar and gravel road. Have you ever seen those? They spray the tar down and put the gravel down, you know, and when it gets hot, the tar bubbles up between and makes a popping noise on your tire when you go over it. That's the kind of road it was in those days. So we're going along just fine, about 35 miles an hour. I'm hanging on the side of the car, you know, hair pulled back, tears streaming out my eyes this way, dodging bugs. I am not sure exactly what happened. Even to this day, we're not sure, but uh, apparently the chain came off and got tangled up in the back wheel, and the back wheel stopped turning. And in much less time than it takes to tell the story, the bike was gone out from under me. Poof. I tried frantically to run 35 miles an hour. Immediately, I discovered I could not do it. And so down I went poosh, into the gravel on the side of Highway 150. But I did not, or could not, I don't know what happened so fast, I did not let go of the handle of the Volkswagen. So Mom had been looking at me, checking up on me while she's driving along, and she noticed I was gone. She thought, oh no, he fell down. That's the way I always fall, Mom. You ever know anybody falls up? And so now my mom thought, you know, he may go under the back tire of the Volkswagen. She had been dragging me in the gravel, and so she wisely swerved to miss me and started dragging me across the hot, bubbling blacktop. <laughs> they took me down to the hospital. <clears throat> We had been there before <laughs> on numerous occasions. <laughs> the doctor took one look at me and said, what happened to this kid? My mom told him the story, and he, those poor doctors, they get to see it all, you know, <laughs> emergency room doctors. He said to the nurse, he said, well, I want you to go get Bertha, Gertrude, Matilda, and Zelda, please. A few minutes later, in through the door came the four biggest nurses in the world. He said, ladies, I want you to hold this kid down to the table, please. One by one, they went around. Each one grabbed an arm or a leg. They're smiling, holding me down. The doctor reached under the table and got a bucket and poured in some Fizahex soap and filled it full of scalding hot water and put something in there to cut the tar. I don't know what it was, even to this day. But then I could not believe what I saw next. He pulled out a regular Walmart or Kmart scrub brush. I thought, 
No, this is a hospital, man. They're going to have something, you know, chrome, stainless steel. No, nope, just a regular old plastic scrub brush like you buy at Walmart all day long. He dipped it in that hot soapy water and said, <clears throat> ladies, hang on. <laughs> he began to scrub and scrub my little seventh grade carcass. My whole right arm, my whole right leg, right side of my body had been dragged through the gravel and then through the tar to seal the gravel in there. And he had to scrub the tar off and try to get all the gravel out. I want you to know I tried desperately to kick them fat ladies off. <laughs> but I couldn't do it. They had me outweighed about 300 to 1, totally against the Olympic rules. So after about 20 minutes of him scrubbing and scrubbing and scrubbing, he said, okay, that's it. He's done. Wrap him up and send him home. So they wrapped me up and sent me home. Several days later, when we took the bandages off to see what was left of my little seventh grade carcass, I noticed something interesting. In my left elbow, I discovered some cinders and tar that they missed. They're still there right now. If you think, I'm going to go back to the hospital and let them scrub this out, you are mistaken. I can run faster now. By the time they caught me, they'd be too skinny to hold me down. I intend to leave those right there. Doesn't bother me. Feel you know, kind of weird having rocks in your elbow, but, you know, not a big deal. When I die, the worms can eat around it if they don't like it. They're going to stay. I have no intention of getting them out. It's not worth the pain. You say, Brother Hovind, who cares? Well, I think we got a problem in America and around the world. I'm tolerating some rocks in my elbow, which is not a big deal. But there's an awful lot of Christians tolerating sin in their heart. They're not willing to get it out. King David said in Psalm chapter 51, Lord, I want you to purge me with hyssop. Hyssop is a little bitty scrubby weed that grows over there. It's kind of like a built-in scrub brush. And that's what they would use to scrub their pots and pans. They would get a hyssop weed and scrub the pots and pans. David said in Psalm 51, I want you to purge me with hyssop. Man, he must have wanted to be clean. Saying, Lord, I want you to scrub me. Get this out of my life, please. I just want to ask you one question tonight we're going to talk about here. Do you have a clean heart? Is your heart right with God? Not how much money do you give to the church? No, no. Is your heart right with God? I think what God was doing with Job, in Job chapter 40, 41, or chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41, God asked Job 84 consecutive questions. Job never answered one. In chapter 40, the Lord said, Behold now Behemoth, and we talked about that in video number two, how Behemoth was the Brachiosaurus, or the, what some people used to call the Brontosaurus. Uh, never was a Brontosaurus, but probably the long-necked dinosaur like that. We come to chapter 41. The Lord is still talking, giving Job his 84 questions. And the Lord said, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Now what on earth is a Leviathan? Well, some reference Bibles say Leviathan might be a whirlpool or a whale, some say it's a crocodile. I don't think it's any of those. I think Leviathan is probably Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, I don't know. I can't prove this, but I've read it many times, and it seems to fit, and it may or may not be right, but I'm preaching tonight, so for tonight it's Tyrannosaurus rex. <clears throat> T-Rex is a pretty rare dinosaur. Only 22 have been found. <clears throat> the biggest one was about 24 feet tall. His head was a little smaller than a Volkswagen. His brain was about the size of a baseball. Apparently, not too bright. I have a replica on the table down here of a T-Rex tooth. That's one of his teeth. Here's a replica of one of his toenails. You can call 1-800-FOSSILS, and the guy there will sell you the replicas. A replica of one of his little bitty two front fingernails, which means he had to be very careful when he picked his nose. T-Rex was a pretty good-sized dinosaur, probably weighed between 10 and 15 tons. Estimates range up even to 20 tons. Nobody knows for sure. All they find are the bones. But the Lord said to Job in chapter 41, Canst thou draw out Leviathan with a hook? Right. Who uses 10 or 15 10-ton test line when they go fishing? Of course you can't draw out Leviathan with a hook. God's asking Job these questions, and Job's not saying a word. Job never answered one of God's questions. Suppose you did. You're out here fishing, and you snag something heavy, and you pull and you pull, and up out of the water comes a 24-foot-tall 
Tyrannosaurus Rex. He comes walking over to your boat, and you notice he's got a hook in his lip and a string leading down to your pole. <laughs> he says, uh, <clears throat> hey, is this yours? <laughs> no, sir, Mr. T, I ain't never seen that hook before in my life. <laughs> That's my brother's hook. Of course you can't draw out Leviathan with a hook. Job doesn't even answer a question like that. So the Lord goes on and said, Canst thou put a hook into his nose, or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? You think he'd beg for mercy from you, Job? Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Hey, Job, why don't you train him to haul your wed wagon around the block? Nobody trains T-Rexes to do tricks. Right? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird? <whistles> Perch. <laughs> right. All 15 tons. Boom. Or wilt thou bind him for thy maidens? There you go, Job. Tie him up and bring him home for your daughter to play with. You better have a lot of spare daughters. Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Have you ever been invited over to your neighbor's house for T-Rex steaks on the grill? Hmm, probably not. Shall they part him among the merchants? You never see him for sale in the store. Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? Lay thine hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. I think God is saying, Job, go ahead and grab him. That's the last thing you'll ever do. <laughs> go ahead, Job, grab him. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? Just looking at him would scare you to death. How many saw Jurassic Park? Remember when the guy's sitting there on the commode and all of a sudden the roof explodes and rah, in comes the T-Rex? <laughs> Scary scene. Just looking at him would scare you to death. So then the Lord said in verse 10, None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? And there's the whole point of the passage right there, folks. God was setting Job up. God said, Job, you scared of this guy? Sure, Lord. He's big, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Would you mess with him? No, sir. God said, Job, are you afraid of me? Folks, I think that's the whole point of the passage. I think God was using this Leviathan to help Job understand he had lost his fear of God. We've got a lot of folks in America that have lost the fear of God. They fear their friends more than God. Question tonight, how big is your God? I mean, is he big enough to tell you what to do and you'll do it? Do you fear God or do you fear your friends? I think God is doing this to prepare Job really for judgment day. Someday we're going to stand before God. And it's not going to matter what your friends think. It's only going to matter what does God think. And this Leviathan that God was showing to Job was getting Job prepared to say, Hey, Job, you're afraid of him to stand before him? You'd be scared? Yes, sir, Lord. Hey, Job, you're going to stand before me one of these days. Folks, we're going to stand before God. Hey, how big is your God? Ever think about that? Do you expect God to come like a puppy dog when you call? Okay, every, okay kids, quiet. We're going to pray now. Dear Lord, bless the bunch as they crunch the lunch. Amen. I mean, it's, you just expect God to be there, don't you? You know what you ought to do sometime? You ought to get off by yourself and just sit down and say, Heavenly Father, and just stop right there and don't say another word for about 30 minutes and just stop and think about what you just said. Do you, do you know who you're talking to? This is God. We ought to come when He calls instead of expecting Him to come when we call. Hey, how big is your God? Is your God big enough to tell you what to wear? Does God determine your clothes? The Bible's pretty clear on this one. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Women should adorn themselves in modest apparel. Be addressed modestly. Women, when you get dressed, you ought to say, Lord, I'd like to please you. Please show me if this is proper. My daddy always said, if you're not in business, don't advertise. Real simple. Is your clothing modest? That's what the Bible says. I didn't write it. I think it's important. Is your God big enough to tell you how to cut your hair? I was lifeguard. Long, beautiful, blonde hair. When I got saved, I started reading my Bible and I came across 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It said it's a shame for a man to have long hair. It doesn't say it's a sin. It just says it's a shame. So I prayed and I said, Lord, I don't want to be ashamed. 
and it doesn't say how long is long, and I've heard all the arguments back and forth, but I think it's wise to say, to have the attitude of God, I will do whatever you tell me. If you show me, I'll do it. That's it. Just show me, God, I'll do it. And read that verse and say, get off by yourself and say, okay, Lord, what would you like me to do? How would you like me to have it cut? How, is your God big enough to tell you what to talk about? Does he control your speech? The Bible's pretty clear on this one, Ephesians chapter 4. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. I remember when I got saved, sophomore year in high school, East Peoria Community High School, it used to be a big deal in the locker room. The guys would see how many cuss words they could say in 10 seconds. And here I was, 16 years old, and I got saved. And I wanted to please the Lord. But for the next four or five months, I was afraid to open my mouth. I was afraid what might come out. Anybody else ever have that problem when you got saved? I'd walk up to some friend of mine and I would say, I would think it through first in my mind. Make sure it's okay. And I'd say, hello, how are you doing today? <laughs> it was, is that bad? Is your God big enough to control your speech? Hey, fellas, when you're on the job and the rest of the guys are telling their dirty jokes, does God control your speech? How big is your God anyway? Just something to consider. Does God control what you watch on TV? I mean, who's got control of that remote at your house? Somebody gave me a little pillow. It says, King of the Remote. You know, it's got pockets in there to keep the remote in for the TV. You ought to make Jesus the king of your remote. Psalm 101 said, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Suppose you made a rule around your house that if you ever heard a cuss word on TV, you were going to shut the TV off for two hours. Just suppose. I mean, you wouldn't want to do this, of course, but just suppose. Suppose you made a rule that if you saw one person immodestly dressed, you know, Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, you're going to shut it off for two hours. Or if you saw somebody drinking alcoholic beverages, you know, Matt Dillon going in the Long Branch, you're going to shut it off for two hours. How much would you watch? Maybe you ought to glue that verse on the TV screen. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Both folks, we don't do that. How big is your God anyway? Your God big enough to control what kind of music you listen to? Well, here's one that gets just about everybody. What kind of music you listen to anyway? Let's see, the Bible says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Is the Lord pleased when you sing songs that talk about adultery and fornication and running off with somebody else's wife? And I mean, just, just think about it. Is God pleased with your music? I would challenge you. Take your favorite song or songs and just write the words out and just read them. I remember my one good friend of mine and I were building a house together and he was listening to a song, or some rock song on the radio. And they started cursing God in the middle of this song. I said, did you hear what they just said? He said, you know, I've heard that song a thousand times and I never heard that. And it was plain as day when you listen to it. He called the rock radio station and said, hey, I object to one of the songs you just played. They said, if you don't like it, change the channel. Click. They don't care what you think. But God does. So what kind of music you listen to is going to determine how your thinking process goes. Does God, I'm just asking, how big is your God? Does he control your music? It has a powerful effect on you, you know. The Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And every one of us is going to receive the things done in his body. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Folks, Judgment Day is going to be fearful. How big is your God anyway? I mean, if you stood before a T-Rex, you'd be scared to death. Do you have a healthy fear of God? That's all I'm asking tonight. Hey, how many of you would be interested if I could save you $50,000? Would anybody like to save $50,000? Listen carefully, and I'll save you some money. When one of my sons was seven years old, we went to the dentist, and the dentist said, uh, Mr. Hoven, this kid has a cavity. <clears throat> I said, yes, sir, I knew about it. Are you talking about the big one up here or just one in his tooth? He said, well, just the one in his tooth, we can, the only one we can fix. I said, okay, doc, let's fix it. So the dentist said, now listen, son, you're going to have to sit still, hold real still, open your mouth real wide, and I'm going to give you a shot. You're going to give me a shot. Yeah, calm down, calm down. I'm going to give you a shot. You're going to drill the bad stuff out and fill it with silver, and you'll be out of here in no time. No problem. 
Well, he tried to sit still. But when the dentist pulled out that 12-foot needle and poured in 10 gallons of lidocaine, he freaked out, lost control, kicking, screaming. Have you ever seen a kid do that in the dentist chair? Maybe you've done it yourself a time or two. He wanted out of there now. So the doctor called the nurse, and she came in and sat on him, and I sat on him, and the doctor sat on him, and we tried to hold him still, but man, you've got to hold real still for that stuff. And finally, the dentist was getting all nervous. He said, man, I, I can't do this. He's got to hold still. I said, Doc, let me take him outside and talk to him for a few minutes. Maybe I can calm him down. We went out to the van, sat in the back seat of the old Chevy van. <laughs> I said, son, I love you very much. He said, I know, Daddy. I said, son, I told you to sit still. You did not sit still. What happens when you disobey Daddy? He said, you get a spanking. I said, that's correct. Bend over. And boy, did I give him a spanking. It was a doozy. A few minutes later, the smoke is rising off his hind end, and the tears are coming down his cheeks, and the pearls are coming out of his nostrils. I mean, the whole thing. I said, now listen, son, we're going to go back in the dentist's office, and you're going to sit in that chair. And if you wiggle one time, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm just calmly going to take you back out to the van and give you two spankings like you just got. And then we're going to go back in the dentist's office, and if you wiggle, I'm going to bring you back out and give you three spankings in a row like you just got. And we're going to go back and forth all day until I get tired. And I played tennis for years, son. I have an excellent forehand smash, as you well know. I don't think I'll get tired for a while. You know, folks, we went back in the dentist's office. That kid sat in the chair, opened his mouth, grabbed the handles, and didn't move a muscle. I don't think he even breathed for 20 minutes. Boy, the doctor drilled it out, filled it up. We were headed out the door. And the dentist said, uh, Mr. Hoven, come here, please. I thought, <clears throat> uh-oh, what did I do now? He said, uh, listen, Mr. Hoven, uh, I don't know what you said to that kid outside, but I'd like you to work for me around here. <laughs> I said, no, sir, you don't want me working for you around here, man. The H-E-W would have me locked up the rest of my life. You know, the difference... When he was in the dentist chair the second time, he was still scared of the dentist. That had not changed. But something had changed. Now he was more scared of me. Great psychological difference. He's more scared of me than anything in the world. That's the way I wanted it. You say, Brother Hoven, how does that save me $50,000? Well, calm down, relax. I'm getting there. I pick up hitchhikers a lot. I used to drive 1,000 miles a week when I first got into evangelism. Now I fly almost all the time. But when I pick up hitchhikers, all the time, once in a while, one guy will get in like this guy did one time, and he said, hey, do you mind if I smoke in your car? I said, yes, sir, I do. i got to practically live in my car, and, you know, you're going to get out, and the smell's still going to be here, so please don't smoke in my car. He said, oh, okay, no problem. I understand. I said, tell me, sir, uh, how much do cigarettes cost? He said, oh, man, $1.75 a pack. I got my calculator. I said, $1.75. I said, how many packs do you smoke a day? He said, oh, two and a half. I said, times two and a half. I said, do you smoke every day? He said, yeah, every day. I said, times every day. I said, how long have you been doing this? He said, oh, 35 years. I said, times 35 equals $50,000. I said, sir, you have spent $50,000 on smoke. You have made your own cloud. You could have bought a brand new Corvette, a couple of Toyotas, Hondas, rollerblades, skateboards. Nope. You decided to buy a cloud instead. And now you are standing here on the street corner with your thumb out asking me for a ride because you couldn't get your cloud started this morning, could you? I said, you really ought to stop and think that through one more time. Spending $50,000 for a cloud is not a smart investment. By the way, 50000 is a drop in the bucket. Wait till he goes to die from that habit and see what it costs. That's when it's really going to cost a bunch. That's why they want this universal health care. That's the Ted Kennedy philosophy. I want to drink and cuss and smoke and run around with wild women, and if I get sick, you've got to help me pay for it. You know, maybe we'd be smart to do like I do for the last nine years. We don't have any health insurance. No health insurance? No. It makes us watch our health, that's for sure. 
We don't go to the doctor for every little thing. Suppose nobody had health insurance. Prices would drop a lot. An awful lot. I'm not recommending that necessarily, but uh, the health insurance concerns me a little bit since over 70% of all health-related problems are self-induced. Some people have some kind of habit that ends up destroying their health and they want everybody to help pay for it. Well, look, if you want to destroy your health, that's fine, but I don't want to help pay for it. That's all. I asked this guy in the car, I said, sir, you spent $50,000 on smoke. I said, how old were you when you smoked the first cigarette? He said, I was about 13. I said, why did you ever smoke the first one? He said, well, I was with my friends. I said, you can stop right there. I know the rest of the story. When you get with dumb friends, you're likely to do something dumb. How many of you ever did something dumb when you were with somebody who was dumb? You get dumb and dumb together. There ain't no telling what's going to happen. Right? <laughs> The problem that kid had when he was 13 years old, he was more afraid of his friends than he was of God. See, if he had had a good fear of God, when his friends said, hey, would you want to smoke a cigarette? He'd say, oh, man, I can't do that. I don't have a mouth. What do you mean you don't have a mouth? What's that? He said, oh, this ain't mine. This is God's. Plus, I couldn't hold the cigarette anyway. I don't have any hands. These aren't mine. These are God's. I mean, really, if somebody had the right fear of God, you never would have started that habit. And some of you girls are going to get yourself in trouble because you're more afraid of that boyfriend than you are of God. And you're going to be out on a date someday, and he's going to say, I want to kiss. You're going to say, no. He's going to say, yes. You're going to say, no. He will say, yes. And he will be very persistent, I assure you. That's the way they're made. So... What you're going to have to do, girls, the only language they speak, when the boy says, I want to kiss, you say, no. He says, yes. You're going to say, you want to kiss? Yes. Okay. Close your eyes and pucker up. While he's puckered up, take off your shoe. Keep your eyes closed. Rear back. Might as well go way back. If you do it right, you can knock him into next week. When he wakes up, if he wakes up, he will have huge lips out to here. And he will be thinking for the first time in his teenage life, two thoughts at the same time. He will be thinking, wow, that hurt. And he will be thinking, that's the kind of girl I want to marry. If my lips ever... Go back to normal size. See, the problem some of you guys have at work, you're afraid to stand up for what's right because you're afraid of your friends. They tell their dirty stories and you just stand there. You don't just say them necessarily, but you listen. I walked in to buy a tractor for our church one time. This guy that sold the tractors, huge guy, must have been 6'5 or 7, I don't know, he's giant, weighed probably 350. Huge guy, owned the company. I walked in ready to spend $5,000 to buy a tractor for our church to mow the grass. And he was on the phone talking to somebody, and he was cussing and screaming and using God's name in vain and slammed the phone down, turned around. There I was standing at the counter, check in hand. <laughs> he, he'd been cussing, cussing up a blue streak, you know. I said, Bill, I don't appreciate you using my Lord's name in vain. I came in here to spend money at your business, and here you are cussing my God, who I love, and try to serve. He walked over to the counter, looked down at me. <laughs> there I was, standing under this giant of a guy. He said, thanks for telling me. He said, I didn't realize it was getting that bad. It's getting bad, isn't it? I said, yeah, Bill, it's real bad. Now, you ought to give your heart to the Lord and get saved. Let him start cleaning that mess up you got in there. See, the problem some of you guys have... You're more afraid of your friends than you are of God. If we had a bunch of Christians in this country that feared God above all else, we could make a radical change. Our job is to do what's right. God's job is to worry about the details. You just do what's right. I stop people when I see them drinking and driving. 
I say, if you get in that car with that can of beer open, I am going to call the police and turn you in. And I get threatened and yelled at and cussed and everything else. And I say, look, you can say anything you want. I'm just telling you, I have to drive on this road. My kids drive on this road. And before I let you run over one of my kids, I am going to report you to the police and have you arrested. And they can threaten me. They can beat me up. They can do whatever they want. But my job is to do what's right. And God's job is to take care of the details. But an awful lot of Christians have got a fear of man. And the Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. What we need to do is say, God, what do you want? I'll do it. And some people in their job have a chance to make a little extra money by doing something wrong. Hey, your job is to do what's right. God's job is to take care of the money. You just do what's right. And that little boy at 13 years of age got a bad habit because he was afraid of his friend, afraid of his friends instead of God. Job 41, 4, 14, I mean. Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible roundabout. You know, some reference Bibles say this thing is a whale or a whirlpool. Whirlpools don't have teeth. Check it out. You'll see. His scales are his pride. Scales? Uh, whales don't have scales. They're a mammal. They have hair. They give milk. 2,000 pounds a day. Utterly ridiculous. Uh, his scales are his pride. Shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. This guy's got scales. You can't poke a spear through. They are joined one to another. They stick together that they cannot be sundered. By his kneesings. His what? His kneesings. You know, when the King James translators came across this word in the Hebrew, it's the word atish. And it means blowing air out of your nose. They got together and said, fellas, how are we going to translate this word? We don't have an English word that means blowing air out of your nose. They said, well, the only thing to do then is to make up a brand new word. It's kind of like sneezing, but it's not really sneezing. So they made up a brand new word, kneesings. You're looking at it. Only place it ever appears in the Bible. Never before, never again, by his kneesings, when he blows air out of his nose, a light does shine. What? what it, when he blows air out of his nose, a light shines. What, that's what it says. And his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke. Now, that's no big deal. I've seen deacons do that on the front steps of churches. <laughs> As out of a seething pot or cauldron, his breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Brother Hovind, you say, is this talking about a fire-breathing dragon? Yep, sure is. You say, come on, this is just symbolic. This is like, you know, describing Satan. Because Satan is called a dragon. It's just, it's a symbolism. Well, it's true, Satan is called a dragon. But he's also called a lot of other things. He's called a serpent, and there really are serpents. It wouldn't do any good to say Satan is like a serpent if there weren't, wasn't a serpent to compare him to, would it? He's also called a roaring lion. The devil's like a roaring lion, and there really are lions. And the devil is called a dragon, and there really were dragons. You say, come on, Brother Hovind, you believe in fire-breathing dragons? Yeah. I got four reasons why I believe in them. Let me tell you my reasons why, and then you can tell me all the reasons you don't believe in them. I'll be glad to have a nice discussion with you about this. But reason number one, it's pretty hard to read that passage in the Bible without coming to the conclusion that this critter could breathe fire. Wouldn't you say that's the obvious interpretation of that verse? I mean, if you gave that to 5,000 people, all of them would come up with the same idea of what it's trying to say. Wouldn't they? That's the obvious interpretation. The Bible says the Creator could breathe fire. Secondly, there are hundreds of legends about fire-breathing dragons. Why do so many countries have legends about fire-breathing dragons? I mean, don't you think that's kind of a coincidence? If they're just making up the story, why didn't somebody have a fire-breathing hamster or something? Hmm? Why, why is it always fire-breathing dragon? Kind of a strange coincidence, don't you think? Thirdly, it is chemically possible to do this. To mix chemicals together and they burn their enemy. That's what Bombardier Beetle does. You can get World Book Encyclopedia, Science Here 81 edition, and read about the Bombardier Beetle. They've got this beetle glued down with a drop of yellow wax on his back and a paper clip stuck in there. He's clamped into a ring stand, so he'll cooperate for the photographer. And then they reached up with the tweezers and pinched his front leg. The beetle is thinking, man, there's that ant. He's biting my leg again. Those guys never learn. This beetle has a cannon back near his hind end. 
He swings it around at the enemy and poof, blasts his enemy with 212 degree chemicals. The temperature of boiling water. Now where does a beetle get something 212 degrees? What's he got, a furnace back there? The ejection system on a bombardier beetle shows basic similarity to the pr propuls pulse jet propulsion mechanism of the German V-1 buzz bomb of World War II. What the beetle has evolved is an intermittent explosive process that fires 500 pulses per second. The explosive energy comes from the mixing of two separate fluids, hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide with oxidative enzymes. The fundamental question, of course, is how can many small random mutations contribute to the development of mechanisms of the pulse jet, its two fuels, the pumps, the fuel reservoirs, the control system, when only the complete perfected system has survival value? Although creationists argue that the theories of evolution and natural selection are unconvincing here, it is still possible that atheistic factors still beyond our ken are operating, and what we really need is a better theory of evolution. <laughs> That's the grasp in its draws. How on earth could a beetle evolve something so complex? What he's got back in his hind end, he has two compartments where he stores these chemicals, hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide. If those two get together, they explode. <laughs> now, the beetle does not want them to explode in his hind end. <laughs> that would be uncomfortable. So he has another chemical that he mixes in there. It's called the inhibitor. It prevents the reaction from taking place. But now it doesn't do any good because he sprays it on his enemies and they lick it off and keep chewing off his leg. So he has a fourth chemical that he sprays in at the last possible second. The fourth chemical neutralizes the third chemical and allows the first two explode. Is that too complicated? There's four chemicals. The first two explode. The third one makes them not explode. And the fourth one takes away the third one and the first two explode. Now timing is very important for the beetle. <laughs> if he forgets to put the neutralizer in or the inhibitor in one time, He's history. If he puts the neutralizer in too soon, he's got a problem. And this beetle, as it slowly evolved over billions of years, you would hear them exploding in the jungle as they practiced their chemistry. <laughs> and they would gather together for the funeral. And Grandma would say, kids, take a look at your Uncle Herman. Look at him good, boys and girls. He blew his whole hind end right off. Do you want to die like that? No, Grandma. Well, then quit goofing off and pay attention in school. Someday we're going to be a fire-breathing beetle, you know. <laughs> oh, listen, folks. If you think bombardier beetle evolved by chance, you need help. <laughs> he doesn't know nothing about chemistry. He's never even been to kindergarten. His whole body is only that big. His brain is even smaller. All he knows is if somebody bites you, squirt them. They'll leave if they're able it even works on big enemies. Here's a toad about to eat bombardier beetle. Picture number two, beetle is in the toad's mouth. Picture three, beetle is back out. <laughs> and the toad's tongue is laying on the floor, and he's backing off saying, Woo, somebody call the cook. Ugh. Too many jalapenos on that one. Man, we got to lay off this Mexican food for a while. Okay, my uh, fourth reason for believing in fire-breathing dragons is some of the dinosaurs had strange compartments in their head. Nobody knows for sure what they're for. The Parasaurolophus, for instance, had this weird bump on the back of his head. It's an enlargement of his sinus passages. It's hollow, and it's connected to his nasal passages. They call him the hollow-headed dinosaur. Even T-Rex had a head the size of a Volkswagen and the brain the size of a baseball. The rest of it's full of plumbing connected to his sinuses, which means if he stored chemicals up there, he could spray them out his nose or mouth at will, or at anybody, it wouldn't have to be will, but he could spray them out, and it could have been a fire-breathing dragon. It is chemically possible. It is anatomically possible. Historically, certainly something happened, because there's an awful lot of history, and the Bible says there was one. Now, those are my four reasons. If you've got reasons you don't believe in it, I'd be glad to hear them. Next verse says, <clears throat> when he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid. Like that guy in Jurassic Park. Doesn't matter how big and strong you are, you'll be terrified when he comes after you. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. You can't scare him with your spear. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. People say, no, hold it, Brother Hoven. He lives in the water. 
Psalm 27, I believe it is, talks about Leviathan in the water. Several verses talk about him in the water. I understand that. I've read all those verses. But, folks, it doesn't do any good to breathe fire under water. Probably the critter could go on land or water. A lot of animals do that. I would bet if you were 24 feet tall, weighed about 15 tons, had a head the size of a Volkswagen, and you could breathe fire,